Good morning, everyone. I'm coming to you this week through a pre-recorded video. I'll explain in a second. I didn't want to miss this opportunity to continue with the material because it's so important to so many people who join me every week and who have told me uh, about this mysterious feeling of why they don't feel like enough. And this feeling overtakes their life. It overshadows it. Um, this belief derails them and prevents them from wanting or feeling that they can just get up and do what's needed the next day, whatever that day requires of you. This week, just such an event occurred in my life, and I want to spend a little time today with you, sharing it with you. This past Saturday night, my younger sister Nancy died suddenly as a result of a, a health crisis that simply overtook her. The reason I'm going into any detail is that I believe that the truth will help you picture any similar challenges that you have in your life. Challenges that cause you to need to get up and carry on despite the pain that you're feeling, like I'm feeling now. Many, many years ago, Nancy had a surgery where part of the process was to remove a valve at the bottom of her stomach called the pyloric valve. Fast forward 25 years, and suddenly this protocol has caused Nancy to silently aspirate. Now, for those people who don't know about silent aspiration, it's when your own saliva, probably while you sleep, um, can back up in your system. And instead of going down into your stomach, it goes into your lungs along with the bacteria. And without you even knowing it, it overtakes your lungs and it causes that bacteria, which is now in your lungs, to result in pneumonia. Nancy struggled with silent aspiration over the last few years. And many, many times she had to urgently head off to the hospital because of the pneumonia. Every time except this last time, she managed to get help in time. And like so many problems we all have in our life, she didn't cause it. But it was a legacy of something that she chose to do that was meant to help her. Her lungs became increasingly damaged by pneumonia after pneumonia. So she lived with constant portable oxygen support. She lived with it. She adapted. She carried on until last Saturday night. For whatever reason, her oxygen levels dipped severely enough and quickly enough that her lungs shut down and she collapsed. Help simply couldn't get to her in time. And she left this world. There are so many times in all of our lives when things happen. Did we ask for them? No. Did we make them happen? Not entirely. Maybe sometimes not even at all. Were we any part of why they happen? Doesn't necessarily follow. And this is the same for you as it is for me right now. So when I thought about canceling this podcast, because I knew you'd understand, I realized that so much of the work we've been doing for the last year together is really about overcoming challenges, even the worst ones. You face challenges like this, and today I face it. We still must get up. Even when we don't want to, even when we don't think we can, we don't understand how we're going to, day after day, despite the challenges that we didn't ask for, do we deserve them? No, but they're part of life. They come. They come to all of us. We still must get up. The truth is, we can, even when we don't 
feel we can. We don't know how we can. We must. We must find that part of ourself that helps us to understand that we must and to embrace the next day, to give the best we have. It might not be our best, but to give the best we have of the good we have to offer to one another and at the same time ourselves as well. And so it occurred to me that by sharing this awful experience in my life with you and carrying on as I really wanted to do anyway, even though for sure this is not a great day in my life, by sharing with you, it might help you see in real terms, beyond the theory, beyond all the talking, what getting up and carrying on looks like, authentically and untheoretically for sure. You have the same ability inside you too. I don't want these podcasts to just be interesting information that I present to you and theoretically you consider them. It's not enough to just talk. To make changes we want for ourselves to happen, we all have to deliver on the talk. Talk is cheap, frankly, and I want the work we do together to be more than that. And so I come to you today more than a little bit shaky, I have to admit, but really wanting to be here with you. Because sharing our hour together every week on Wednesday mornings is frankly a happy spot in my week. And I really enjoy seeing all of you, hearing your stories, sharing whatever the weekly successes or challenges have been. I am like you. Today I have a challenge. And I decided to share it with you. Even though it means I have to slow down, double check my work for sure, because my mind is elsewhere. I have to, and I will, just like you will, adapt and then do whatever is necessary today, together with the supports I have. And today you're one of those supports. And any day you need support, there will be support if you look for it and you accept it to just keep on moving forward. Not feeling my best, and as many days I'm sure you don't feel your best. That's the raw truth of keeping on. And I thank you for being here and giving me a wonderful reason to make the effort today. Now, on with our next challenge. And that's getting out from under the shadow of imposter syndrome, which randomly disrupts the person's best efforts. We covered step two last week, and so this week we're going to continue with step three. And step three requires us to run a little experiment. So let's do it. Let's commit to doing it. Just for an hour if you're having a shaky day, or if you're feeling a little braver, maybe a whole day. The point is to make yourself temporarily Maybe just one situation at a time. Let go of that imposing, limiting belief you give yourself of imposter syndrome. However, before you can take this new path, you have to decide that you really want to test it out. Strange as it may seem, and this is true, letting it go can feel like a loss. Imposter syndrome, if you live with that to whatever degree you live with it, is what you've known for a long time. Are you ready to let it go? And if you did, what would you do instead? 
what would you do instead of staying under that shadow? Have you ever actually thought about that? Have you ever actually thought that that was an option? If you took a minute right now, what two thoughts come to your mind about what you could tell yourself and what you could do a little differently? Because we all know, all right, that, and if you don't know it by now, you haven't been listening, that what we do, the options we give ourselves are heavily, heavily influenced by what we tell ourselves. And this little experiment is going to help you figure out, is it even possible that the whole time you're holding yourself back? How are you doing that? By telling yourself that imposter syndrome is the problem. When really, it's not your inadequacy. Remember, imposter syndrome feels familiar. And it's been with you long enough that it actually, in a kind of a perverse way, can give you a sense of security. Making a change, on the other hand, can feel intimidating and disrupting. If you felt insecure before, running this little experiment that I'm proposing may not, especially in the beginning, make you feel any better. So ask yourself, last week I asked you, are you prepared to pay the price for happiness? So today I ask you, ask yourself, what am I going to gain by this? And the answer is possibly, there's a lot more to you than you've been seeing. And you're actually more capable than you believed you were when you kept telling yourself how inadequate and not measure up against other people you were. You're perfectly capable. You're not perfect. You're not capable of perfection, but you're perfectly capable. All right? of making that change. Tiny baby step chains called improvements. And if you go back to Jane Burka and Lenora Ewan's book on procrastination, it's called growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Because I hope by now you've given up on the concept, the very concept of perfection or ideal or whatever other word you use for it. None of those situations, none, none of those states are realistic. They're just not. It's very difficult to change, especially by simply trying to subtract or take away something. What you need to ask yourself instead, if you want to have any level of success, is what are you going to do differently? What are you going to add, substitute? But it has to be meaningful. It can't be some trite phrase from a book. It can't be some blank theory, all right? Because it has to be meaningful to you, what you tell yourself. Because you are the one person who has the code to unlock your deeper understanding. And until you deeply understand something and you integrate it, it's just talk. It's just a theory. No one else has that ability. Even as your coach, even if you were I, you and I were doing counseling together, I don't have answers for you. My skill is in helping you drill down to find your own answers. All right? No one else has that, that code. All right? So what that also means is, logically, you are your own best advocate. Now, I've met some of these people. Some people are reluctant to admit being wrong because this would mean that if they look back on a situation that they've actually suffered without needing to. 
and regrets might set in that potentially they missed out on a lot. Are you willing to look at that possibility? Are you willing to face that down? That maybe you've been obstructing yourself by what you've been telling yourself? The only thing inadequate about you was and is having an idea about how to do something differently and not being willing to try it. There's no magic. There's no secret. Willing to try to do something differently most of the time, not all of the time, gradually trying to grow and improve a little bit at a time with no expectation that you're going to arrive at the nirvana of perfection. No one ever overcame anything difficult by feeling less about themselves. If there's any part of you that believes that thinking of yourself as an imposter actually had a positive side, had advantages because what? It made you work harder. It made you aim higher. It made you do better. It keeps you on your toes. It stops you from getting big headed and complacent. And it tells you, you shouldn't get used to doing well, just in case it falls apart. So it saves you from disappointment. If any of those thoughts come to your mind and you hold on to them, they're not like fleeting and you say to yourself, really, I have to beat myself up? to stay on my toes, to not get complacent, to aim higher, to work harder. So if you don't do what you've been doing, beat yourself up, how do we choose to change our view? Because know this, if you really truly believe that by beating yourself up repeatedly, that somehow that made you perform better, the, the truth has to be that you were able to do whatever you've been doing, whatever level, and probably more under the influence of this beating? Well, if you just stop beating yourself up, if you just stop wasting your energy on that and disabling yourself, undermining yourself, imagine what you could actually do with a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset with the target being ideal or perfection. Positives create positives. Negatives create negatives. When you're working on changing your belief, I want to go back to Dr. Jessamy because I believe this as well. I agree with her 100%. She suggests that especially all right, when it comes to, and these are my terms, limiting beliefs, it can be really helpful to think of that limiting belief operating in the same way as a prejudice. Now, we don't like the P word, and it isn't procrastination, it's prejudice. But do we prejudice ourselves? Dr. Jessamy suggests that you think of someone in your life all right, now this is her idea, who has a prejudice against a group of people that you see as wrong. If you wanted to change that person's view, wouldn't the first thing you'd have to do would be to get them to agree, All right? Then you'd need to show them what? Multiple examples of contradictory information and situations where their prejudiced viewpoint wouldn't and couldn't be true. Hard facts, real life. You'd need to help him or her keep track of it. Okay, so that they can't deny it or quickly forget because ruts are easy to slip back into. All right? The belief you hold about yourself, though, as an imposter, acts just like a prejudice. No matter how much new information contradicts your beliefs, have you been reluctant to change your view? 
to just pause for a second and consider that there might be more to this story. There might actually be more to you. As with a prejudice, you discount the positives, that positive feedback that's right there for the observing. And what else do you do? To accomplish the imposter syndrome, you need to distort the reality of what is actually going on, especially as it relates to seeing yourself for the truth of who you are, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. When it's impossible, all right, to refute those limiting beliefs, you believe it's a one-off. So you get it right, you succeed, or heaven forbid, you excel, all right? You've got to go looking for how to refute. And the best way is they just like me. It was just luck. It's got to be something external to me. It can't be that I actually delivered on this. All right. Now, changing your viewpoint, especially of yourself, is not a straightforward thing. All right. Anyone with any degree of imposter syndrome has developed so many ways to cling on to limiting beliefs. To give yourself the best chance, though, the best chance of seeing and hearing new messages, being able to give those messages to yourself, a really great way to do it is to externalize the imposter's voice. Now, quite often when I'm working with people in hoarding situations and they're living with any degree of obsessive compulsive disorder or obsessive compulsive personality disorder, I describe to them how to see that as a tyrant within and to check out whose voice is the tyrants. And sometimes we've been doing things so long to ourselves without questioning it. Prepared to pay the price. Sorry, a little gun shy when we keep repeating the same loop. Didn't like it the first time, but we go back there. Is sometimes we voice over the tyrant's voice. So sometimes. We have voiced over the imposter syndrome voice. Externalize that voice now. You need to see it not as your voice, but as the voice you've given your fears. All right. The better you get at spotting the imposter's voice in action, as you can feel it coming on, the more successful earlier intervention, better results. Growth mindset can learn to see that thing coming all right, and head it off at the pass. It will work for you. Think of this voice as a bully. Nobody likes bullies. Every day it tells you that you're not good enough. All right? You need to work harder. Never fail. You've got to do everything perfectly or it doesn't count. The best way to make a bully a bigger bully and better at it is to give in. If you experience a bully in any form, if you're going down anyway, and you always go down with a bully, all right, even when you bully yourself, you're going down. The best way. So if you're going down anyway, go like a lion. Go down like a lion. Don't go down like a lamb buying on for it. It threatens. It threatens you. All right? And if you don't, if you don't fight it, then you are defrauding yourself. The voice, that bully voice, your fears scare you. And they have scared you into doing whatever that fear wants. Those beliefs, even though they are limiting, even though they are false, they have a promise attached to them. And the promise is that even if you're uncomfortable, 
you're uncomfortable in a safe way. You feel it's normalized. You normal feel safe, even when you know it's not good. Right? And if you don't risk just doing your best, just speaking up, for instance, just saying what you actually believe is the best information you have based on the best information available to you, okay? That imposter syndrome, if you just don't do that, it'll take care of you. It'll keep you feeling in a safe zone. Well, a familiar zone anyway. Imposter syndrome actually doesn't have your best interests at heart. Maybe, you know, maybe the idea of a bully doesn't work for you, or maybe it's too triggering. Maybe you've been bullied. Okay, anything, use any other substitute for externalizing that voice of your own fears. All right, because anything that helps you disown the imposter's voice and then allows you to fully appreciate that the voice on those limiting beliefs you keep repeating to yourself that keep you in the shadow. They're not worth listening to. And they don't represent reality any more than the other. Thoughts like feelings aren't facts. Okay, neither are feelings. They're not facts either. Just internal representations, both the feelings you have, all right, and the thoughts you have, those are just internal representations of what you've been telling yourself. Even if the limiting belief voice tells you that something is true, it doesn't mean it's true. How many people have told you, sworn up and down, that they're telling you the truth? They believe it at the time. It doesn't turn out to be factual at all. Okay, don't light a match near it. It's going to blow. It's so faulty. Feeling like an imposter doesn't mean you are one either, even if sometimes it feels like you are. There's always more than one perspective, all the time, in every situation. There are probably six good ways to do anything, so I'm not thinking signing up to believe you're an imposter is your best option. All right, so don't tell yourself it is. Look for other options. They're there. When you feel discomfort, remind yourself that this is just how you feel. This is not how you are. When these thoughts and feelings come up, like they have for me since Saturday night, think about different possible explanations that there might be. And ask yourself first, what's the evidence that these limiting beliefs, fears, thoughts, what is the evidence that these might be true or might just be the way you feel, which is very transitory? How would I see this if it was happening to a friend? What would I be telling them if challenging the beliefs, those limiting beliefs doesn't work for you right away. If you can find humor in it, laughing can always take the power out of anything. Best way to get over being afraid of something is to imagine it in a way you can laugh at it because you can't be afraid of something you can laugh at. Perfection alert. Accept you can't control everything. In fact, any control you have over anything is usually time limited. Also, at the moment you subscribe to any limiting belief that you are so important, that you must be completely responsible for making everything go well, watch out for the following. Are you also taking responsibility for everything that goes wrong? Statistical impossibility. And when it does go wrong, you blame yourself first and foremost. 
Do you believe you could or should have prevented it? So you're going to judge the future based on information you only had in the future. You didn't have it at the time. You had to call it. Think about that one. Are you obsessing? Are you planning all the different ways to try to stay in control? It's a losing proposition, folks. Don't waste your energy. Influence. You can influence things. There's almost nothing that you can absolutely control. So don't set yourself up for it. You're buying a lot of heartache. You're taking too much responsibility for making things go well. All right. You're forgetting at the same time about the other people involved and their shared responsibility. We are not so important in this world that we are the be all and end all or that we can one handedly turn things around. Go back to procrastination by Jane Burke and Lenore Ewan and read that chapter about having to go it alone to get it right or go it alone so that nobody else is alongside you to see you completely foul up and get it wrong and have to recover and struggle. I've got news for you. They're struggling too. Life doesn't always run smoothly. This week is evidence of that for me. No matter how hard you try, there is no path through life that's pain-free. Letting go doesn't mean that everything will always work out well. This is not nirvana. This is not the secret to happiness, all right? But even though everything doesn't go well or maybe even work out terribly well, it's okay. We're going to be okay if we just keep getting up, if we just keep finding the happy spots in our a day that are available to us, or like this podcast in you and I, the happy spot in my week. So next week, we'll talk more about the need to be in control. You take care, and I would ask you for positive thoughts, and lots of energy sent my way for the next little while. You take care and thank you for coming today. Thank you for being part of my week. <laughs>